What is up, everybody? This is the Fantasy Baseball Show, and I'm your host, Sean Nugent. Today, I'll be looking exclusively at first base, primarily focused on 5x5 five five roto category leagues, but I will make points every now and then for when guys are especially good in one format over the other. Uh, right off the bat in first base, I think it's really important to understand what kind of league you're playing in when it comes to drafting your first base, because Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Freddie Freeman are elite top five if not top ten if not top five players in a points league they don't strike out a lot they walk a lot they, they hit for good average of course they have great power so if you're playing in a points league those guys definitely get elevated another reason that playing uh picking first base is especially important when it comes to points versus roto is because your first baseman will not get you steals uh the the, the highest projected steals for a first baseman is paul goldschmidt with eight according to AC, atc projections so in a points league, that means nothing. And that means in a points league, uh, you, you you do downgrade uh, Goldschmidt a, a, a significant more than you think in a points league compared to Rota because those eight, eight steals mean a lot more at first base than they do for any other position. Uh, so always keep that in mind. And again, Guerrero and Freddie Freeman are amazing picks in a points league, but I'm not really too enamored with them uh, coming into this season and drafting them. Of course, Guerrero is, is about the fifth or sixth overall pick. You know, he finally lived up to what we all thought he could do last year. He would have been MVP if it was not for Shohei Otani. And you have Freeman behind him at pick, uh, 19 to 20. And I just, I don't, I'm not finding myself liking the price for those guys. I've always been big on Freeman. And Freeman was going at a, at a higher pick uh, in the previous year. So Freeman's kind of regressed a little bit when it comes to his draft price. But I really like what I can get from Olsen, Goldschmidt, and Alonzo. The guys going to three picks later. Olsen around pick 42. Goldschmidt around pick 50. And Alonzo at pick 58. Those guys give similar uh, power output. Maybe Goldschmidt gives less, but Alonzo and, uh, and Olsen are 40 home run guys. The projections have Alonzo getting 40 home runs, Olsen getting 38, and Vlad Guerrero getting 42. So that, that's 42 more home runs you're going to get from Guerrero compared to those two, two guys. Of course, Guerrero is projected for a 300 average, which he should be a perennial 300 hitter. The on base does not mean really anything in a 5x5 five five roto, but he's projected to bat 40 points higher in batting average. But the, R, the home runs, runs, and RBIs are, are really, really similar. And um, as much as I do like doing the positional uh, videos because they, they help you get a sense of, um, of what you want each position, I think it's important to know the depth of each position. The biggest flaw in that is when you knock a player, uh, when, when I'm knocking Guerrero and I'm knocking Freeman saying, you know, I don't, really, I don't really see myself taking Freddie Freeman or Guerrero. It's not necessarily because they're not, uh, they're not really good, uh, you know, stat accumulators and, and fantasy players it's because in the first uh, one or two rounds now increasingly every year you're seeing stone bases being prioritized more and more and to, to pick a guy with in one of my first two picks that's going to be basically a zero in stone bases that's a huge that's a huge risk uh you know at third base at least you have jose ramirez to get you 20 st uh, stone bases 30 stone bases and he's going after vladimir guerrero so, you know, Ramirez paired with an Olsen or, or, or an Alonzo later, that, that's looking really nice. You got your you got power, speed. It's just really hard thinking that I'm taking Guerrero at the sixth pick, and I'm taking a, a three-stone base projection. You know, 42 home runs, I can, I can find that later in the draft. I can get that from Alonzo. I can get that from Olsen. The counting stats will be right there. And batting average isn't as hard to, to find later in rounds. I mean, you're going to sacrifice power, of course. But batting average is not hard to find, especially at this position. There's some interesting late options with Ty France, Jay Cronenworth. But keep that in mind when you're when you're um, you're planning your team. And, you, and you, I I think the one thing I've learned playing fantasy baseball year after year for the past couple of years is that like I find myself going away from Freddie Freeman. And I, and when I first started, I liked him a lot, and I I, I would lose out on my steals. I would be third or fourth in steals. I wouldn't target my saves as much. And like I said, it all comes to knowing what you're playing. I focus on a five by five category league. If you're playing a points league, then and maybe that was my problem. I started in a points league. So a lot of people, I think, especially with the with the prevalence of fantasy football nowadays, a lot of the people that start casually with friends in high school or whatever, most of them people want to play points leagues. But as you start getting more into fantasy baseball and you get into more competitive leagues, points leagues definitely goes away. I don't I don't I'm not gonna put a hundred dollars in a league if it's a head to head points league. Because that's that's more like gambling than it is like playing a, a strategic game. So, so be be aware of what league you start in, what format you start in. 
And you have to shake those biases of those leagues. You have to shake the biases of a points league. And you really have to pay up for those categories, which makes first base, uh, in a way, it makes first base a hard position because because you 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 know there's not a lot of steals. But that kind of makes it a lot easier because then you don't have to worry about paying up for steals. You don't have to be like, damn, I, would I really be be drafting this guy if he didn't steal these twenty bags or fifteen bags? There's no there's no Sophie's choice in that regard. You really got to tell yourself is the is the twenty to thirty points of batting average that Vladimir Guerrero and Freddie Freeman are going to get worth it? In regards to the counting stats being virtually similar to Olsen and Alonzo. And it does, again, boost Goldschmidt's ADP because the stone bases do matter. So I, I, I think I, I give a good input on those five guys. But I really do want to do more of a, a, a comparison to Alonzo and Matt Olsen. So Olsen had a really good year last year. He, he definitely had a better year than Alonzo. But over the last two years, Olsen and Alonzo are pretty similar. Of course, we have the short in 2020. Alonzo did miss a significant amount of time last year. I think that gets overlooked. In the last two years, uh, Olsen only has 30 more plate appearances than Pete Alonzo. So that's nothing significant. We should be able to compare these stats apple for apple and get a good grasp of who's of who's what. In the last two seasons, 53 home runs for each guy. Alonzo in four, 30 to 40 less plate appearances. That's that's 15 more runs about for Olsen and about 15 to 20 more RBI. Olsen has one more steal. Batting average, uh, Alonzo gets the edge. On base, Olsen gets the edge. These guys are extremely similar. I really do think Alonzo is the better value this, this year, without a doubt. I did draft Olsen last year because I, I was getting a little scared with Hoskins, and I, I liked a, you know, a little 100-round pick. But I don't see any reason to pay Olsen at, at, at pick 42 if I can get Alonzo a whole round later. It really makes no sense to me. Uh, maybe if he goes to Yankee Stadium, his, his, his thing's going to go up even more. So Olsen, to me, that's, that's an avoid. Like I said, not saying he won't be great, but you have to see what you have later in the draft. And Alonzo, to me, will provide the same value at, at a later pick. I mean, it's the same amount of production at a later pick, which means way more value. Outside of those top five guys, the position gets kind of sketchy. Abreu, of course, is always slept on. He's going to get the RBI. But we saw a little bit of a power decrease. I'm not, I'm not really too uh, crazy about him. And the ATC projections really aren't too high on Abreu. They have him getting a, a 266 average. He's usually a 270, 280 hitter. Again, 31 home runs, though, 88 runs, 100 RBI. Now, Abreu is the opposite of a Vlad Guerrero and a Freddie Freeman. If you're looking from a pure Roto perspective, Guerrero, uh, Abreu is giving you basically what Freddie Freeman is. Uh, the, the ATC projections have Freddie Freeman and Abreu again, the same amount of home runs, 20 more runs for uh, Freeman, only and three more RBI for Abreu. So, you know, it's, it's 30 points of batting average. The on-base means nothing. That the almost 60 points in on base that Freddie Freeman has over Abreu means nothing. And again, that's why Abreu is always slept on because everyone's getting a little too analytically driven. This isn't real life. That that on base percentage, as much as it helps him get runs, which it does help him get 20 runs, means very little in a roto league compared to a points league or an on base percentage league. You know, roto with on base and roto with batting average. Again, you gotta know your league settings, but Abreu. I, I like Abreu actually at, at the at the pick seventy three. I can see Abreu being my first base one in, in a lot of leagues because if I miss out on Alonzo, then he's right there, and I really don't see myself drafting anyone before Alonzo. And and Mountain Castle, this this gets into a whole situation now with these guys. Uh, Mountain Castle had a decent year last year. I'm not I'm not too sure why Mountain Castle is going at pick one hundred six. Again, that's that's more than 30 picks separate from the the guy before him, Jose Abreu. Uh, mind you, he's he's still going five to ten picks before Lemayhu, which is very odd. Last year, Mountain Castle gave you 33 home runs with only 77 runs with 89 RBI. That's great. Walk percentage was not too high. The, the K percentage was very high. A 309 on base, like I said, on base does not matter a lot. But those 77 runs and only 89 RBI, he's not he's not giving you 100 runs or 100 RBI. So Mountain Castle at pick at pick one. 106, 107. I'm not, I'm not really getting where that's coming from. I'd much rather take my chance on LeMahieu as bad as he was last year. Uh, I think LeMahieu will hit 100 RBIs again, 25 home runs with that three, 300 plus batting average. Uh, just, just comparing. Uh, what I really like to do when I'm, when I'm thinking of a draft is, it's not, it's not one guy. Like, it's, it's, it's what, what's the surrounding guys in the pool? Who, who's around Manny Castle? Who's before? Who's after? Who's 10 picks after? Who's 20 picks after? And, and having LeMahieu right behind him, I, I just got to see Mountcastle's ADP going down because 
there's there's no reason you should really be paying up at a, at a 106 for Mount Castle. Again, 33 home runs, that's great. Oh, another point, I saw other people bring this up. The um, the Orioles ballpark there, I think they're pushing back left field by 15 feet, pushing back left center by a, a little bit more than that. So that's going to hurt. He's going to lose some home runs. I mean, everyone knows how how great of a park Camden Yards did and just ask Gleyber Torres. And uh, that's definitely going to hurt Mount Castle. I'm sure his, his ADP will go down because of that. Uh, but yeah, um, not not like in Mount Castle. In between, right after Lemayhu, though, was Jared Walsh, and Walsh is a very interesting and I would say polarizing guy because he he was really hot and he has a lot of power, but high strikeout percentage, not the best walk rate, 340 on base, nothing bad, but the, the power seems legit. A two a, a 29 home runs, 98 RBI, but if you go to Statcast and you look at uh, x woba compared to a weighted on base, just you know, expected versus what happened. He has the third highest differential between expected and uh, what actually happened. And he has the second in slugging. Uh, first for both is, is Frank Schwindel, who I, I'll talk about a little bit, but I don't really want to uh, don't want to risk a pick on a guy like that. But uh, I'll get back to him in a second. But Walsh is second on those lists, on that list, around guys like Guriel, Belt, uh, Brandon Belt, and Ryan Zimmerman. And you're not seeing anyone draft Brandon Belt, Ryan Zimmerman, and uh, Yuri Guriel is not going for 100 picks later. So... Jared Walsh, that's kind of a, for me, you know, don't take don't take anything I say as gospel, but I like to tell you who I'm drafting, who I'm not drafting. Walsh is not not a guy I'm touching. If I want to take a risk on a, on a big strikeout power bat later, I could take Sano. Uh, he, he's going to get the at-bats, so Walsh, to me, is a do not draft. Cornelius is almost the opposite of a uh, of a um, Jared Walsh. Cornelius does not have a lot of power. He's a lot more like a DJ LeMayhew kind of guy. In his first full season in 2021, 21 home runs. 94 runs, 71 RBI with only four steals. He gave you a 266 average, which is nothing crazy. I don't think you can really justify picking him. You can't really justify getting anyone at first base uh, with with that low of a home run if he's not giving you a 300 plus average. That's why I'm fine taking LeMayhu. I think LeMayhu will be a 300 hitter, but Cronenworth has not showed that he's a 300 hitter, and he hasn't even showed the power that LeMayhu once showed. So I, I cannot take the risk on him. Uh, I would much rather take CJ Cron going later, staying in Colorado. 30 home runs last year, 281 average, and a, and a 378 on base. Am I seeing for Crone? This this is not what. So CJ Crone is really. What, what did he, what did he change in his 11% walk rate, a 281 batting average, 375 on base. Staying in Colorado. 32 years old. Increased, doubled his walk rate from his major league career before that. Took 5% off his K rate. Yeah, if I had to pick between the two, not even a doubt I'm taking CJ Crone compared to Cronenworth. And Cronenworth has a playing time crunch because uh, there's stuff with Hoskins, of course, Tatis, uh, Hong Song, oh, no, Hong Song Kim. I slipped my name. The, the guy, that, the, the international guy they signed and uh, played shortstop and he filled in for, for Tatis. But in, unless they get away, get rid of Hosmer, there's really no spot for Cronenworth. It's a, it's a pretty crowded uh, situation there. So the, the CJ Crone has way more at bats, going at a later ADP, about 15 picks later than Jay Cronenworth. I would say um, Cronenworth's pick 11. After he gets a pick 18, which is Anthony Rizzo, you better have your first baseman. Of course, most people are in a 10 or 12 teamer, but in a 15 teamer, you have to really make sure that no one doubles up or a couple guys don't double up on first base, middle infield. I would not want anyone after Anthony Rizzo to be my starting first base. I'm fine with middle infield, but from from Crone to Rizzo, you have Josh Bell, Ty France, Reese Hoskins, Max Muncy, Tyler Stevenson, who's mostly a catcher, uh, Joey Votto, and then Anthony Rizzo. Anthony Rizzo's going at pick 170. Crone's going at pick 130. That's eight or nine. That's eight first basemen going within 50, 40, 50 picks. So. That's that's where there's going to be a run on first base. I wouldn't be surprised if Rizzo goes a lot uh, earlier than 170 in a lot of drafts. Uh, obviously, he has not signed, and guys' ADP always increases after they sign. So it, I'm surprised he's actually going after Vado. I know Vado had a great year, but Vado's 38, 39 years old. But you really, really need to uh, find a guy you like in the, in this group. Going from pick 11 to pick 18, CJ Crone to Anthony Rizzo um, on the ADP. I don't think you go wrong with any of these guys. I think Crone, Bell, Ty France, Reese Hoskins, Max Muncy I would avoid really because of um, 
because of the whole Tommy John thing, his, his, his elbow and his shoulder seems kind of messed up. So I would say Muncie, no, uh, just, just because you don't want to take that risk. Uh, Reese Hoskins had a similar risk last year, and he didn't really pan out. But he's, he's still going the same ADP he was last year. Uh, Muncie was going a lot earlier than, than Hoskins last year, so that's changed because of the injury. Tyler Stevenson, you're not going to start at first base, but uh, that's a great pick for your catcher going between there because he's going to get a lot of at-bats. And then uh, Joey Votto and Anthony Rizzo. I'm, I'm really fine with all those guys, like I said, the exception of Muncie and Stevenson because Stevenson's not really first base. But all those guys, I think they're great. Uh, these are the best values of the draft. Ty France will give you batting average if you miss out early with 20 to 30 home runs. Good, good runs RBIs. That, that, that Mariners lineup's looking better. Bell, even in the down year at 28 home runs, he's he still produced. He always hits the ball hard. He's in a tough lineup, so it's going to be kind of hard for him to, to get the runs RBIs. But he's probably a trade candidate if he's not a free agent. I don't believe he is. But if he's still in Washington, I could see them trading him to a contender at the deadline. And really, this is – and at Hoskins, again, two really interesting uh, power numbers – only played in 107 games, still had 27 home runs, below a 64 RBI. The on-base was horrible for Hoskins standards. Only at 334 on-base, which is very weird, even with that with that high walk rate. Uh, I expect a bounce back for him. So Hoskins, I'm buying back in on. It's probably the third year in a row. Uh, maybe, I, I think, you know, to point out my own biases, I could be chasing those amazing skills he showed uh, in, his, in, his, in his brief rookie year where he played about 40 to 50 games some amazing numbers and he's never really lived up to that uh, he's been a great player but nothing crazy uh, nothing nothing that you can't find elsewhere and of course like I said Rizzo when he signs him he'll probably move up a little bit more I'm still buying on Rizzo uh, really not even that bad of a year only 22 home runs yes but the, the play discipline was really good 9% walk rate 15% K rate still not striking out a lot the on base was was pretty low for Rizzo, uh, Rizzo standard but it was a career low uh, BABIP and he's had some troubles with with injuries and, and stuff like that, and moving around. And he he played hot for the Yankees when he came there, but I expect a bounce back from Rizzo. Of course, like I said, he has to sign. But once you get past Rizzo from the ADP board, it's it's a murky situation you're looking at. Alex Kirloff, who playing time's really not even uh, set in stone with him yet, he made his debut last year. Yuri Gurriel, who fine player, but I mean. You better have some sluggers in your team. Only hit, only hit 15 home runs last year, but he did have 83 runs, 80, 80, 81 RBI. So if you have a power 319 batting average, if you have a power heavy lineup. You could take Gurriel, um, preferably as a middle infield. I wouldn't want my starting first baseman to be so low in the home run. So. If you get one of those big guys, you know, you, you can't you cannot take LeMahieu, Cronenworth, um, even Goldschmidt of France and and get Yuri Gurriel. Uh, you know, if you if you get if you get Ty France, uh, you can't take Gurriel as as your thing. It's not enough home runs coming from your first baseman. Uh, Jonathan Scope, interesting guy, uh, m mostly a second baseman. I guess he played enough first base last year with Detroit. Only 22 home runs, still got 84 runs, 85 RBI, 278 average. He's he's the epitome of a, of a great Roto player. He's going to get you the playing time. He's going to get you the production. 674 at-bats, which I think was the second most at a first base listed here. Third most, only behind Guerrero, Olsen, and Freddie Freeman. So uh, Scope's a fine option. Again, these guys cannot be your starting first baseman. Scope's a fine middle infield. They really can't be Frank Schwindel. I'm not taking a risk on him. Like I said with his his expected statistics, that's such an unknown quantity. The playing time is going to be there. I'm not worried about that. Compared to Bobby Dahlbeck, who's who's probably not going to get the uh, bulk of the at-bats if, if once Cassis comes up. Red Sox have a huge prospect, Tristan Cassis, which could be one of the premier first baseman in the league. And, and in a draft and hold, you could uh, look at him, but in a, in a regular league, it's kind of more of a guy you pick up on the waiver wire. You don't want to burn a spot so for so long in him. But... Uh, Schwindel is going to be playing more than Dahlback. They're only going to pick apart. So between those two guys, I like Dahlback. But compared to Brandon Bell, I don't know if there's something I'm missing with Brandon Bell. I know he didn't have a lot of plate appearances last year. I thought that was injuries. Uh, he only played about half the season, 361 plate appearances. 29 home runs in, in 97 games. But a 378 on base, a 274 average. Slugged him a 600. Uh, I'm taking Brandon Bell over Dahlback and, and, and Schwindel and Scope and Guriel. And Nathan, Nathaniel Lowe after him, and Spencer Torkelson and Miguel Snow, 
all these guys. Within within a five player radius each way, Brandon Belt sticks out like a sore thumb. Let me know if there's some news I'm missing. I'll do a Google search after this and, and see. I mean, I know there's injury concerns, and I guess they'd bench him against lefties, but most teams see righties. I know the San Francisco was good repping the hat. You know, you know they were good because they they the Kappa and the management were so good at playing the matchups and amazing pinch hitting, five pinch hits in a game, and, and it was it was a crazy season. I understand they that belt's not gonna get the you know, bats he would have gotten before, but I I think 550 at bats is not crazy when it comes to an elite hitter like that against right-handed pitchers. Uh, it's kind of like Jesse Winker for the Reds. I mean, you verse 90% righties, 95% righties, so these guys are gonna get their plate appearances. Uh, really, really after that, it's it's a you know it's it's a unforgiven position. Carlos Santana has fell off the map. Eric Hosmer has fallen from the graces, going to pick three sixty. Uh, there are some guys I like going later. Of course, uh, Jesus Aguilar going to pick two eighty four. That's kind of been a repeating problem uh, for the Miami Marlins. I love Garrett Cooper. I'm a big Garrett Cooper guy. Really good skills, hits the ball hard. And I like Jesus Aguilar, but they're both taking each other's at-bats. And until Miami figures that out, I really can't be interested in either one of them. Uh, you, you you know, it's kind of just a dead end right there. Lamonte Wade Jr., you're not touching him. Again, playing time with that San Francisco team. Uh, Pavlin, Pavin Smith, I like on Arizona. Uh, this is more of a deeper league thing. And definitely not your starting first baseman. But he has really good plate discipline. Uh, Pavin Smith or Pavin Smith, I, God forbid, I don't know how to exactly pronounce the name. Former first round draft pick, seventh overall pick. Made his debut in 2020 in a couple games, not really a lot. But last year, uh, hit 267, only a 328 batting average, uh, 328 on base. 11 home runs, 68 runs, 49 RBI in, uh, in almost a, in 148 games. So he played a full season. But he showed he showed elite uh, plate skills in the minors. Eleven uh, percent walk rate, twelve percent K rate. I think you'll see some growth from him this year. Uh, in, in his last year in the minor leagues, he had a three seventy on base, two ninety one batting average. Uh, like I said, walks as much as he strikes out. That's just the kind of guy to see an eye on. If you set him, you see, you see him getting hot when the season starts. If he starts hitting for pop, I think I think guys like him and the way Ty France did it and the way Ketel Marte and the same team did it. These guys that have really good elite control of the zone. They can make that uh, transition to, to hit for more pop. He's a young kid, I think 24, 25, 25 years old, left-handed bat. Not the best park in uh, in uh, Arizona, but uh, look at his teammate Cattell Marte. His teammate Cattell Marte was not a power hitter. And then he spiked a 38 home run season because these guys that can walk as much as they strike out, they they, they have such good hand-eye and such good uh, ball uh, bat control that they, they can tap into power. They grow into the power. They start pulling the ball. They get comfortable with their swing. They, they start finding pitches to hunt. So keep an eye on him. I really do like him. Pick 363, not really a guy you draft. It's more of a guy, like I said, if he's getting hot on the waiver wire, remember his name. Okay, he's, he's not, he's not, he might not be a flash in the pan. There could be skills there. I mean, he's going right after Eric Cosmer. I don't think they'll be drafting leagues. Pick 33 and 34 uh, off the board for first baseman. So these aren't guys you're going to be drafting. Yanni Diaz, crazy enough, going after him. Great player, 380 something on base. Not, not hitting for any power. Um, it's 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 a really tough position to not be a power hitter at. Uh, it's the it's obviously the toughest position to not be a power hitter at. They're first baseman. But um, let me know what you guys think. Um, it's always nice doing these videos. It's always nice hearing the feedback. Shout out to McClure's Revenge. Been with me since last year. I appreciate the feedback, man. I love hearing uh, you guys talk to me in the comments. Uh, I had one guy reach out to me about the league I want to start doing. But, yeah, you know, I need you guys to hit me up, man. I want to get a league with you guys going. Roto points, whatever we decide on. Get a group chat going on Twitter. Uh, my, my Twitter account, my Instagram account, uh, the email, they're all in the description, every video. Again, love talking to you guys. Love hearing the feedback. Uh, let's just cross our fingers and hope we get a season this year. Peace out and have a good one.